The first tycoon is the biography of Cornelius Vanderbilt, the man who made his fortune in railroads and shipping and at one time was considered the world's richest man. Speaking of Vanderbilt, his biographer Stiles wrote, he did have his beliefs, chiefly in his own genius. Hello, I'm Ramesh Damani, welcoming you back to a brand new episode of Wizards of the Street. Belief in free markets is, of course, a cornerstone of investing genius. My guest today has an MBA from Vanderbilt University. He's done stints at State Street Global Advisors and spent 17 years at Goldman Sachs in a variety of key positions. Since 2017, he is the founder and MD of White Oak Capital Management with over six billion in assets under management. Please help me welcome Prashant Khemka. Prashant, welcome to our show. Thank you, Ramesh. It's a pleasure to be here. Prashant, uh, I want to go back to your early years. What got you interested in the stock market? Certainly. So as a child, Ramesh ji, I uh, grew up in a middle class Marwadi family. Uh, my father, Like I did too. <laughs> my father had a store, a garment store, and all our savings, my grandfather's as well, were invested in, in stock market. Some, I mean, odd lots, minimum lots, received an IPO allocation, some 150 of those. So while we were, as I said, maybe middle class, uh, we were surrounded by friends and neighbors and uh, relatives were mostly far wealthier. So always was uh, wondering how to make money uh, and uh, more money. So I was reading books like Think and Grow Rich. By and Napoleon and Rich, yes. Yes, absolutely. So around in 19, actually in 1985, July 1985, my great grandmother had passed away, and as was customary that time, extended family would get together for 12 days as Correct. a ritual. And everyone was talking about how they're making a killing in equities. That was the Rajiv Gandhi bull Rajiv market. Rajiv Gandhi's bull market, yeah. So they doubled, quadrupled in Tata Ordinary, Tata Locomotive, and Century, and No Sill, and Baroda Rayon, and so on. So I felt like a Eureka moment. This is how I can double my money every year. And make your family wealthy. Absolutely. And but how 5,000 can grow to a crore pati. Right. Within. A lot of people influenced you in your life. I know your granddad was a big influence in your life. Goldman Sachs clearly was a great influence in your life. What are the enduring lessons you learned from some of the people who helped you in your journey to become uh, the MD of White Oak? No, absolutely. It is, um, you know, the lessons learned from my interactions with various people over this since, you know, as you said, uh, from grandfather, for example, learned that it's impossible to predict uh, the market. Um, in college, you talked about Vanderbilt. Really, um, first time I realized that it's a cash flow based analysis that's most powerful in determining value. Not necessarily earnings or EV to EBITDA. Absolutely. So until then, I was using all those price to work, price to earnings and so on. But that was the revelation in, uh, at Vanderbilt in the mid-90s when I realized and have completely switched to cash flow-based approach. Then under my boss, Herb Ellers, in 2000 at Goldman, um, really learned how to conduct professional research. Until then, it was more of a retail investment, retail investor style. Then as, as uh, someone who started GSAM in India, uh, learned how to build teams and establish strong investment culture had the opportunity to invest globally in developed markets at uh, uh, US growth equity team at Goldman, um, and also in managing the emerging markets business. So that exposed me to business models and business environment in so many countries around the world from you know Mexico to Korea. A lot of emerging markets. Absolutely, and here at White Oak, for the first time, the experience of owning and running a business has been um, has been tremendously insightful because so far was only investing in businesses without necessarily appreciating uh, what goes on in the promoters or owners you know mind as they are running the businesses. So yeah, it has been all along. I understand that your granddad, uh, of course, taught you that you cannot predict the future. So good advice, but he also uh, made you do summaries of balance sheets. Yeah, absolutely. So that's how, you know, his way of teaching me, he'll, uh, when uh, good old days, you remember annual reports would come, even if you have one share of right. any company, the annual reports would come, physical copy. So he'll ask me always to summarize any new annual report that will come. He'll say, summarize for me, what is the management saying? What are the numbers looking like? And all that. So that was very, very helpful lesson in those days. But despite the summary, in the 92 bull market, the so-called Harshad Benta bull market, you had a pretty bad ending, didn't you? 
Absolutely. So uh, we were not just myself, but two of my friends. We borrowed money, a uh, lakh rupees each, which was quite a lot of money Princely for sum. college yeah. college students at the time. And they entrance interested it to me because they they thought I was a investing genius. And we ultimately ended up losing all the money, more or less all the money. Fair enough. But uh, did that discourage you from equities? Because here's a somewhat of a thieves' den that you get forged certificate. Why not stick to retail, which is what your family calling was? Well, I think the fascination with markets was too strong to to have been discouraged by losses. I mean, since then I've had other substantial losses as well in almost every bubble burst. Because as I've mentioned before, I don't try to time at any time the markets. I'm fully invested at all times. At all times. At okay. all times throughout. So there were substantial losses, but I've never lost a night's sleep on those losses, and um, I've never thought of because I don't know of anything else to do uh, since. I've been hooked on. No plan B. No plan B. Until the age of 13, I wanted to be captain of Indian cricket team. But <laughs> since then, I've been hooked to the equities. I, I think we all do. Uh, uh, Prashant, you went to America to get an MBA uh, from Vanderbilt University, storied university. Why Vanderbilt and what did you learn there? Certainly. So, see, why Vanderbilt? Initially, um, obviously, the... Uh, at that time, didn't have the money to pay, first of all, for of an MBA education. So the primary selection criteria, to be honest, was only colleges that would give me scholarship. Yeah, And then within that set, look for which one had the best finance education. So Vanderbilt ranked very high. The faculty at Vanderbilt in finance was very strong. And they offered me full scholarship, so complete. It's a private institution. All my Tuition was waived off and even was given an opportunity to work with a professor at twice the regular pay, which helped me pay off my living expenses as well. And in fact, the professor then recommended me for the first job at State Street, which I received and was the beginning of my career. Which is lovely, of course, that you worked for a university that made the first tycoon in business and now you follow tycoons uh, for a living. Uh, you worked at State Street and then you were recruited by Goldman Sachs. Not an easy job to get for an immigrant. Uh, how were you recruited? And tell me about your years at Goldman Sachs. Yeah, definitely. So uh, there was an alumni, again, from alum from Vanderbilt University was working at uh, Goldman, who referred me to this very high-performing team, U.S. growth equity team, based out of Tampa, Florida, founded by Herb Ellers. Uh, Goldman had acquired Liberty Asset Management that was founded by Herb Ellers. So he forwarded my CV to, the, uh, to him. I went to interview as was customary. I had a dozen odd rounds of interviews and was very fortunate to have been offered that position. And later on, and I still stay in very close touch with Herb in a couple of weeks' time, would be having our usual annual catch-up. Uh, and when I asked him why did he hire me, he, he told me basically because of your enthusiasm for investing and the fact the that passion. you've been... Absolutely, the passion and enthusiasm and the fact that you've been investing since very early days. And it was very apparent in talking to you, that's what you want to do for the rest of your life. And that was a key reason that he brought me on. That, that's fascinating. But what does it Goldman teach you? I mean, this is a very hard-driven work culture. Sometimes you work 18 hours a day. Sometimes you don't have any weekends. Was there any work-life balance that you got out there? What uh, And how did you learn to invest at Goldman? Certainly. So see, Goldman is a giant organization with various divisions. And the different divisions have their own, you know, style. And all. Fortunately, at in Goldman Sachs asset management, each team ran like a boutique of its own. And there was no enforced approach top down, which is very good. And so in this US growth equity team under Herb's leadership, he ran it as his ship, as his boutique firm, which he had founded. So I learned a lot, as I said, the professional research, how to conduct management meetings, um, how to source for ideas, present and convince to the broader team, uh, then how to manage portfolios when, when I was given those responsibilities. Um, and from Herb in particular, I learned how to build strong teams, keep them motivated all the time, um, and how to be a very meritocratic leader, which has then helped me over time as I built my own teams uh, over there. So the most important lesson during the Goldman, early Goldman days were to observe Herb and his leadership style. Yeah? And then in later years, as emulate I established... Emulate that. Sorry? Later years, emulate that. Emulate that as well. 
And so, in as I got the opportunity to build the GSAM India team initially, um, and then now White Oak team, so those observations uh, were very helpful. But tell me, 98, 2000, maybe you joined uh, Goldman Sachs at the peak of some dot-com bubble, and you were running U.S. equities at that time, maybe for a decade or so. At that time, did you look at the Indian markets, or were you only focused on the American markets at that time? No, no, absolutely. My daytime job was managing uh, clients' money, investing that in U.S. But in the evening, when I would come back home, I'd log in and follow, and uh, you know, be investing in Indian markets, particularly while I was at State Street, yeah. Uh, because uh, at at Goldman, it took me some time to get all the approvals and compliance approvals and permissions from all the way to the top to have the brokerage account uh, year, which I did get in 2003, 2004 timeframe. But I continuously followed the Indian markets all throughout. That's fascinating. You're at the high octane market of the US. It bounced back from the dot-com bubble at some point. Uh, India still, by 99, 2000, you barely had one company listed on NASDAQ, which was Infosys. What was your interest in, uh, what kept your heart beating about India? Or India, certainly. So, <laughs> uh, see, always was sure I was coming back to India and was starting an investment management firm in India. So that was never you in doubt. You knew that uh, when you give up the dream of being a cricket captain, that that's v what you want to do. Very much so. So never, never ever doubted that. So I had to maintain that connect, and not just had to maintain, that was a, a passionate connect, you know, that would have been there in any case. What we'll do is uh, we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll chat some more about your returns and how to profit from the Indian stock market with Prashant Khemka of White Oak. Now, QCI has launched a marquee campaign called Gunvatta Se Atma Nirbharta. So what is the role that DARPG is going to play in this campaign? We've had a long association with QCI that dates back to 1990. And QCI's team of young professionals have worked uh, tirelessly to make these special campaigns, to make these innovative practices possible over several decades. Meet the champions who are breaking the barrier at the workplace. The change makers who are coming together to chart a new path towards gender parity. You need women to realize that they can do a great job at home as well as in the office. Conversations such as this will trigger more and more corporates, more and more managements. A mega initiative to make gender parity an attainable reality. HSBC presents CNBC TV 18's Future Female Forward, the Women's Collective. market maestros before crafting your investment strategy? How about getting deep insights into their businesses from top Indian honchos before putting your money on the line? How about making every trading day profitable with strategies from the market masters, macro pundits and chart wizards? Only one show gives you a head start to your trading day. Get ready to profit. Get ready for business with Bajar at these times on CNBC TV 18 and CNBC TV 18.com. Nine PM, where the big stories are simplified, bite by bite. Brostax. And welcome back to all of you on Wizards of the Street. I'm still with Prashant Khemka of White Oak Capital. Prashant, uh, we we're talking about returns uh, and your love for Indian equities. At some point, you threw your hat in the ring. Uh, you quit a steady and good paycheck at Goldman Sachs and decided to hang your hat. Was India the only choice or would you want to run U.S. dedicated money at that time? 
What was your thought process in, I guess, 2017? So it was a big step after 19 years in corporate uh, world. But as I said, I was very clear, had to do it at some point. And, and, and 2017 ended up being, uh, being that time. Um, India, I felt like was, uh, rightly or wrongly, confidence why it is more like a bird in hand. And something that I felt very confident about generating um, top ranking or peer group leading performance, which is needed initially to be able to uh, build a investment management business. Down the road, I knew that at some point in time, we'll start as we did earlier this year, an emerging market strategy, which I used to lead at Goldman as well. Yes. And, and so, but initially to begin with, also the resources required to begin with, to start an India team could be, you know, like we started with nine people investment team, but to do proper service to managing an EM fund or a multi-regional fund, especially the way we invest very bottom up, you need at least 20 plus people team in my view. So which we have right now nearly a 40 member team. So to begin with could not have afforded or taken the, would not be judicious to build such a large team on day one. Who are your early investors in your India fund? So early investors fortunately, um, you know, were some of the investors that I had met with for long while I was at Goldman. Uh, but for some reason or another, they never gave me money at Goldman. But as soon as, to my very pleasant surprise, as soon as I started on my own, they were very willing and forthcoming to engage and, and fortunately trust us with the money. That that's was a, most that's amazing. A happy coincidence. But uh, Prashant, uh, you had a certain investment philosophy guiding you at Goldman based on past history. Uh, you now start White Oak. You have a certain personal philosophy. What were the differences and similarity in the investing approach that you followed at Goldman and that you're following at White Oak? Actually, Rameshi, as I was saying, uh, one thing very good about Goldman Sachs Asset Management was there was no uniform, chopped down philosophy or process imposed upon everyone. Boutique. It was every team leader was, uh, you know, allowed the room space to build their own philosophy and process on their team and implement that. So that's when, when I came to India, it was very much like a boutique, no interference from the US, particularly when you're small, there is no interference. Obviously, when you grow larger, New York wants to know what's happening and you're not going to screw it up and all that. But it was, you know, fortunate in that regard. So I could, I could design and construct the team and the team's philosophy and process and build a investment culture as I saw appropriate. Prashant, a lot of people, uh, fund managers, are disdainful of macro, the top-down approach. You called the piece macro chakra. But still, I'm going to quiz you on a few of the things. Uh, the first thing is the markets, at least till a few days ago, seemed optimistic that the inflation problem is solved, inflation numbers are coming down, the Fed slowed the pace of increase. What is your view? I do think on this very particular aspect of inflation, uh, that the worst is behind us. I do believe that the infl inflation last couple of years was sparked by the supply chain disruptions uh, that followed COVID. So to, in um, March 2020, everyone was worried about demand destruction, which would cause supply glut. That's why spot oil happened. went to negative. And right. the opposite happened opposite a happened, few, yeah. few months later. So it was a supply disruption which continued for much longer because of COVID zero policy of China, as well as then another shock, supply shock, which was Russia invasion of Ukraine. And now gradually it is limping back to normalcy. So and inflation you know, will come down. Yes. But uh, quickly in a summary, will globalization come back or has that also been permanently derailed? No, I think globalization is very much there for good. And it is uh, maybe a bit of a speed breaker in the interim. But for India, it's actually can be a very positive game changer of sorts because the companies worldwide are very keen um, to diversify their supply chains. From China. From so excessive, India plus one. Absolutely. From excessive dependence on China, they want to diversify. India has the opportunity and um, it should grab it with both hands, which it is doing so, but I think there's always room to do a lot more. It's an opportunity that So Apple that does 5,000 crores of iPhone sales. that a telling sign to you? That is certainly, you know, from India's perspective, a very big positive. The opportunity size in front of us is compared to that is like tens of times, if not hundreds of times bigger, if you look at the 
manufacturing sector as a whole. So a services-led uh, model that for some time had romantic feelings in India is not necessarily appropriate. We do need manufacturing at the end of the no, day. No, no, sir. It's like, let, as they say, every flower bloom or thousand, uh, thousands of flowers bloom. Services would continue to chug along very strongly, but we can also have manufacturing that's been a missing piece, something where we haven't really shown up over the past uh, several decades. It is the opportunity that we should not miss. Prashant, after 20 years, one thing I know you're not missing is an investment philosophy. If I were to ask you to summarize your investment philosophy on how you pick stocks, and give me an example, historical if you may, about something you enjoyed picking in India or something that you learned from uh, picking badly in India. Can you share that with us? So it's very simple, and it, as I tell when clients ask me, there's no silver bullet in investing. It's uh, like, um, you know, the marathon has had 26 miles for thousands of years, and still you have to run 26 uh, miles, and not nothing really creative you can do about it. Uh, so in investing, we believe um, outsized returns are earned by investing in sound businesses or great businesses uh, at attractive valuation. So the two key attributes we're looking for is strong business, an attractive value. What we consider as great business are ones that have these attributes of superior returns on incremental capital, so going forward capital, a scalability, which is to do with growth, and management should be good both in execution and governance. When you have the opportunity for cash flow generation and scalability, you need management to execute. And when you find companies with all these attributes, you have to make sure you buy at a logically attractive Price. Valuation price to make outsized returns from them. Can you give me so an example? So over historically, the years, historically, um, so many of the names that we currently own are difficult to uh, talk about just from a restriction uh, perspective. Uh, but um, they're without naming specific names. If I were to talk about so financial sectors or IT services sector, you know, IT services. If I take as an example. From time to time, they get written off by the market. Uh, one of the things that market has for the last decade or so believed is that IT services sector is an ex-growth sector in India. Because they think of, uh, or ex-growth sector because Nescom and IT companies, they guide in dollar terms or constant currency terms, which are like dollar equivalent. Yes. So they talk about 7 to 8% growth. Now, you know, in India, 7 to 8% growth doesn't appeal to anyone. Doesn't wake if up anyone. Yeah, if yeah. you're less than double digit, you are no growth or slow growth company. But 7 to 8 percent dollar, dollar growth terms, yes. equates to low double digit to low teens kind of rupee growth, right? And you can't label the entire industry as slow growth because it's a trillions of dollar industry with hundreds of or thousands of players. So a good execution machine, which is small or mid-size, even the largest of Indian companies are small or mid-size by, mid by, you know, global standards. We'll even continue the size to compound. Of the yeah, so the compounding possibility is tremendous. Yeah, and then they are available at cash flow based valuations which are far more attractive than anything else in the market. Fair enough. You know, you, there's a movie called Dawn which I know you like and there's a very famous uh, dialogue in Dawn which says, Dawn ko pakadna mushkil hi nahi, na mumkin hai. Would you say the same about India right now? I would say at any point in time, uh, any market, including India, and most specifically India, I would say, ke when it relates to, like a lot of people talk about Indian markets being overvalued and whatnot. So basically, that's a market timing statement that we'll buy it when it's undervalued. Yeah. Uh, but this has been a common refrain amongst foreign investors and oftentimes amongst Indian investors as well. And you miss the bus. In, and you miss the bus. So in that context, I often say, ke, you know, uh, Dawn still gets caught in the movie, but to catch the market is not possible. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, when you started in 1985, the Sensex was, I guess, under 500. Absolutely. Today is closer to 60,000. Absolutely. Prashant, we have some fun normally at the end of the show. We do a rapid fire. So I'm hoping you'll agree to participate in that. Absolutely. So when I say to you, Herb Ellers, what do you say? Leader and business builder. If your child asked you to recommend an investment bank to work at today, which bank would you recommend? Investment bank or investment firm? Investment firm. Investment firm, I'll say White Oak if you get hired on the team. Okay. There's no uh, nepotism there, right? He has to Only if you get hired by the team. Okay. The best investment book you've read? Valuation by Copeland. Okay. The must-read newspaper magazine in the investment world? Annual reports. Okay. That's what your grandfather taught you. If you could invite any two investment professionals and any two cricketers, living or dead, to dinner, who would you invite? 
clearly Kapil Dev and Tendulkar for okay. So uh, you remember the 85 cricket. World Cup, I think. Absolutely. Still, huh? okay. And and uh, investment. And investment. Well, I'll do it twice with Rakesh Ji. Really? Okay. So, very well said. Hank Paulson or Manmohan Singh for dinner. Hank Paulson, of course, ran Goldman Sachs. Unfair to Hank to be put up against Manmohan Singh, but Manmohan Singh. Okay. The Indian promoter that you really admire. Radha Kishanji Damani. Thank you. Indian stocks over one year, higher or lower? Higher. Estate or inheritance tax, is it likely to come back 2024? Hope not. The one sector in India that you're very bullish on over one year's time frame? IT services. Thanks. My guest is fond of saying investor returns are a function of time in the market rather than timing the market. Well, we can keep debating that. But I know I'm not debating how grateful I am to Prashant for his time today, for stopping by and for chatting with us. Thanks, Prashant. And we'll see you next week on another episode of Wizards of the Street. Bye for now. Thank you, Ramesh. Entirely my pleasure.